Okay. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. I think in the interest of time, it's um, good if we can start immediately because we're already um, uh, six minutes behind. Uh, I think the best way of running this session is to quickly introduce our three speakers and then immediately ask um, Prof. David Olivier to start for us. He's got a few of his own introductions to make and then we'll proceed with the papers and questions. Um, our first speaker then, Professor de Lugier from the University of Johannesburg, a very much esteemed and loved colleague. He's chosen a very interesting topic as you can see. It's all about pores and I have a very weak joke about it that I won't tell. But um, he is going to look um, into the evidence aspect um, of um, law, nature and sustainable development. Then we've got um, my other dear colleague from a long time ago at Vista University, uh, Professor Aga Annette von Imago. She um, has a very um, impressive body of work that concentrates on the rights of victims. And she's also a frequent speaker on um, Radio Sonar Mensa. So <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always delighted if I, I um, drive to work and I sit in traffic for three hours and I hear a familiar voice. Uh, welcome to you. And then we have got um, our third speaker. And you know what? When I was, um, I was always say, a little girl, which means I was 18 years old and working for the Department of Justice. I was very scared of magistrates. It's just the way we were brought up. Um, we have an expert here on sentencing, and we're going to um, also look at some of those aspects. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to ask Professor de Bourdieu to start for us. Thank you, Professor Mallard. Ladies and gentlemen, I, of course, in my previous life, I was a prosecutor and state advocate, and I teach magistrates and prosecutors for many, many years, and I believe serious nice practices better. So I bring with me my evidence, real evidence, documentary evidence, yes say or bark say, you decide. Uh, over the years, and I'm talking about 30, 40 years, in preparing papers, presentations, nationally and internationally, I can honestly say this one excited me the most. Not only because it's in the Kruger, but also it's about dogs. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got in front of you, and I'm very sad to say that I hoped that a special witness would have been here, a dog with the name of Killer. He was the star witness. He was responsible for the for the arrest and the convictions of more than 115 rhino poachers. He specialized in tracking and he fell ill, he's on pension. And also his handler, Amos, on pension. Killer got a gold award a couple of years ago. There are other people who, would have, who should have received also medals. The one is the prosecutor, the other one was Amos, the handler. The other one was the trainer. And also, of course, may I specially mention Mr. Edward Hall, those days the acting regional court magistrate of Mbombela, Nelspreet. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my introduction, introduction about a special dog. Standing in for killer is his anti. Anti, it's maybe a nicer name. I think you should change the name to something similar to killer. <laughs> of course, for poachers, we need a killer. This is uh, Antti, and also, ladies and gentlemen, his handler is Sam. Our chairperson said that she will give us an extra couple of minutes so that they can also say something about how they can't do without dogs in the Kruger. Not only because of tracking and sniffing, but because also of what they are contributing on a daily basis. This is the first part of my paper. The second part is law. That is about law of evidence issues, constitutional law issues that is different from 100 years ago. The Trepedo case that you've learned when you did law of evidence, exactly this year, 100 years old. And I can tell you, 
many courts still accept Rex versus Trepido as the locus classicus. After that, you all know the Shabalala's case, 1986, followed Trepido, and then, ladies and gentlemen, the case of the two Mozambicans, the case of Edward Hall, the magistrate, is the one that we're going to focus on as the first part of the law of evidence issues. Constitutional issues, and then we move towards the second part, and that is the influence of new technology. Artificial intelligence, very important. Where are we at the moment? And I am going to compare us a little bit on an international basis, do a little bit of international comparison with Poland, Netherlands, Germany, United States, UK, and I'm just going to mention where they are and what I think we should do and what can we learn from them. Interesting, the end, ladies and gentlemen, I think we underestimate how important our neighbors are because wildlife is not America, UK, Europe. Wildlife is Africa. And then I will refer you to what is happening at our neighboring states. Very, very impressive. Some of them, ladies and gentlemen, the statistics, good news, how they solved some of the problems. There are still more problems, mainly financially budget things, but very, very important how technology developed as far as an artificial intelligence sniffer dog. They use what they learned from these friends of us dogs, they put it into a computer, they build it into algorithms, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the future. And we will talk about that. I'm focusing mainly on the rhino, but it can also be elephants, etc. It can also be endangered, endangered plants or some of the other things that we find very interesting. So first of all, welcome to our friends from Sandbox, also Ned, welcome. I'm really thinking that this is only the beginning of a real relationship between you people and us in our environmental law and the future of this relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, you may for one moment be excused, I'm going to call you again so that you can give us just a few minutes of how these dogs are doing so good at the moment. I'll pull you back. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a mouthful. I'm not going to focus on each and everything. I already said that I'm going to say a few things on bullet number three, the visibility of the radar train dogs, past, present, future. International perspective, and then of course, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this is especially for our DEC, Professor Sina, he's very interested in those things, and I'm going to focus on a few of those. Some of it, ladies and gentlemen, is work in progress. Some of it we're still waiting for the results. Some of it we're a little bit disappointed. Some of it is dangerous. There are risks attached to certain of these things. We can have a program to predict, but the criminals will also have those software. We can have a mapping system to tell us where our rhinos are. Internal corruption or people selling the information, there's a risk attached to that, that the criminals will now also, with a GPS, can spot where the rhinos are. Law of evidence, constitutional law, and the way forward. My introduction, just quickly, we all, well, not all of us, but the majority of us, I think, will say the same thing. But we think of dogs as our pets. Now we're talking about dogs as employees. They work for Sandbox. They work for the law enforcement. They work for the police. They work for the airport people. They work for security in different roles. That is the reason why they are so special as working dogs. Because of the sense of smell. I talk about the skepticism I'm sorry that Judge Mbar is not here because I am going to be quite critical towards the SEA or let us talk about the AD of 100 years ago and of 60 years ago and I think it is now time for the SEA to come to the party and say once and for all the rules change, the law need to change for the following reasons. There's my reason, Rhino case and then of course the rest I already mentioned. 
If you're a grandfather and you can't take your grandson to tackle you anymore because he may injure you, you trained a golden retriever, retriever to take the tackles. This is a more important kind of dog for a trained dog. This is for Professor Sonicus and myself, a Dutchman, ladies and gentlemen, is of course close to my heart. This is very interesting, maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Very important, we have about 5 million sensitive cells in our noses, compared to 200 million of a dog. More important, why are dogs always licking? Because they also, part of the sensing, part of the smelling is also to taste, and that is increasing, and that is the organ in the mouth. It allows the dog to taste the smell. And that is also interesting. Long after the original scent is not present, they can still continue. We're talking about amazing days after that. They can still add some value. Where did it start? Ladies and gentlemen, in 1896, they start to train dogs in Germany. They use it during the First World War, and we also got some of them imported in South Africa. And I will say, between 1904 and 1913, it started in South Africa, and eventually it established a dog unit, and that is still very effective up to now. These are the different kinds of dogs. I'm not going to show you a video clip of a sheep dog not getting sheep in a crawl, but very large cattle in a crawl. If you have time, I can show you that. And now it's not a sheep dog, it is a dashing. <laughs> Why do I mention the different types of? Not all dogs can do everything. They've been trained for a specific purpose. You're either for drugs, for explosions, for arson, Cadaver, I mentioned cadaver because nowadays they're more and more using artificial intelligence to do their job. But they improve on some stuff. Search and rescue, you all know that. And then what we're going to focus on is tracking dogs. And this is the ones like Tila or like Auntie, and those are what we're going to focus on. They commonly use German, uh, German shepherds, <laughs> golden retrievers, labradors, dobermans, and border cops. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, 100 years ago and 60 years ago, the law was messed up. Why? I'm not quite so sure. Maybe because Rex versus Adonis in 1918, the judge was in the Villiers. <laughs> Trapedo, one of the three judges, was in the Villiers. Trapedo, the Attorney General of the Transvaal Republic in 19, or oh sorry, it was already a union, in 1920 uh, AG, was at the Villiers. Maybe it's a coincidence, but they mess things up. Reasons for inadmissibility, very important. The first one they say, it is hearsay. I struggle to see how they got to hearsay. Hoffman quite ironically said, it's not hearsay, it's year bark. But that is what they say, we can't, because how do you cross-examine a dog? They miss, it's not the dog, it's the expert witness that goes with the dog that will tell you about the training, about the consequence, about the test, and about the expert opinion. But having said that, the jury, we do not have one anymore, but the last one, no scientific or accurate knowledge about the dog smell faculty. Our former colleague and Dean George Barry wrote in 1967 with the topic a geloofwaardige getuie with reference to a dog and he said there's no general rule. 1967, the SCA or the appellate division those days did not agree. There are the other academic commentators. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1971, the police said, but we can rely on our dogs. Please go to the Commission of Inquiry. Let us get an act to make it admissible to hear about the evidence of trained dogs. And I want you to look at that. That was the Bertha Commission, 1971. And ladies and gentlemen, I was in shock when I read 
identification by police dogs should be admissible only when the possibility of error could be altogether excluded. That is, and I agree with Hoffman, that is Hoffman of Hoffman and Zeffert, Sir Hoffman later on, in 1974. This is blatant anti-dog discrimination. I even agree more, because if you look at humans, humans is not, no human will be able to testify if that was the rule. So have a look at the comparison. And then, luckily, he said the following. Fortunately, that's in 1974, fortunately the police dogs need not yet think their cause is lost. Sooner or later we will have a case. 1974, the wheels of justice turned very slow. Next one, ladies and gentlemen, is the case of Tupid and Shabalala, 1986. A shocker, for only one exception. In Shabalala, 1986, he followed Tupido. There's no reason, the facts are similar, so this is the law. Not admissible, because we're not sure about it. The late Fadley van Oosten wrote in 1987, and he pointed out that the judge actually contradicted himself. And there's the quote. The judge said, you cannot say, like George Barry said, like Hoffman said, like Schmidt said in Bavisra, his textbook, like some of the other commentators, like Himstra said, you cannot say that there was no general rule that is applicable to all cases. Having said that, the next sentence, he said, but there may be certain cases because it is not taken as the final pronouncement. So therefore, I'm saying the following. Van Oosten said, what if you have 12 section dogs? Put them through exactly the same test and they give you exactly the same answer. Can you still say, we cannot rely? So what I'm saying is, depending on the circumstances, depending on the training, depending on the evidence supporting this evidence, I'm not for one moment saying that you can convict solely on the evidence of the dog. It's a factor that you need to take into account globally. I refer to Shabalala in my law of evidence class very often. I say in Shabalala's case, naturally the distinction between <clears throat> admissibility and weight must not be blurred. Practice what you preach, appellate division. Because this is exactly what you're doing. Admit and then you can decide with cautionary rules that we use when we assess humans. Taking everything into account, and then he suggests there should be a better insight. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is my case. Two Mozambicans, the facts more or less. 2015, well done, Mr. Edward Hall. Within five minutes, he forwarded me not only his judgment, but the full record of the court. I was so impressed when I read it. I'm going to use some of that. And it's not reported. Sad that it's not reported. It's the way in which you handle documentary evidence, the real evidence. This evidence, he said, I'm not against the start of the Jesus. The law of presidents, I'm bound by the appellate division. But, very important but, he distinguished the facts. He referred to the facts in the Kruger National Park. If you have some time, one of the most beautiful spots, Nwanezi, you can get there by on your way, past Trokwani, you can immediately turn or you can go to Satara and take either one of two routes. Close to the Mozambican border. The facts of this case, ladies and gentlemen, unbelievable, accurately documented by the magistrate. Bringing the dog and his handler, Killer and Amos, within a couple of minutes they picked up the spoor they tracked it one and a half kilometers from there, they found, sorry, there they found the carcass of the lion. Horn of cut. One and a half kilometers, they found people trying to hide. In their possession, a rhino horn and equipment to cut off, like an axe or whatever. And that evidence eventually became evidence in court. And he said, the reason why it's different, and that is Killer's contribution, one case of 150. There's a picture of Killer himself receiving the gold medal. 
I need to move on a little bit faster. Ladies and gentlemen, if we look at countries far from us, close to us, we should not fall behind. Learn from them. If they are happy, not happy. If they are satisfied, not satisfied. If they are convinced that you can use this to what extent depends on the circumstances, who are we to say, no, you can't. The Dutch Supreme Court formally started to say, listen, we want the evidence, we want to scrutinize the evidence, and eventually we will say that we're going to admit it. The same with the US courts. And let me just tell you something. Killer's case is unique. The South African scenario, we do not only depend on lineups. In the torpedo case and in the Shabalala's case, they found a shoe, they linked the shoe with the perpetrator at the lineup. There can be some risk, there can be some negative inferences, wrong inferences that you must be careful. But in the case of Killer and the rest, it wasn't the lineup, it was the real thing. And that is why I'm saying so. It is so important. Africa. This association, African Wildlife Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, it's a unique anti-trafficking initiative. As it's already Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, and they're doing extremely good work. Machine learning is particularly useful. I can say you, ladies and gentlemen, bullet number three. I'm responsible for a forensic investigating course that's running for 22 years. How often am I saying on a conceptual level, it is a perfect match. It's a perfect match. Because in many cases, we do not have the money, we do not have the, the people, and we can use that. The DVC talk about augmented. A balanced approach, how we can add value to each other. I'm talking about Mr. Robot and Mr. Investigator. Interaction is complex. This ASA is, ladies and gentlemen, extremely important in animal poaching because it gives you a prediction. You feed in the data on a continuous basis and the more data, the better the result. You know that's how machine learning and algorithms operate. So this is what I'm saying to focus on extremely, extremely important. The analogy between the so-called drug dog and the machine. In this case, ladies and gentlemen, a number of lessons to save time, we put all of them there. Four lessons to learn. First, we must recognize it is only part of, it's not a sole solution. Do not only rely on the outcome of your algorithms. It's only one part of it. The interpretation is a very important issue because we can interpret in a different manner. That black box that we're talking about is likely to provide accurate predictions and then we need, Professor Bullshit, the human rights thing, we need to take into account, is it against a person's individual human right to be sniffed, to be searched? And this is where I'm going to refer to the sections in the Constitution, guaranteed, and then a very important, and I'm so glad to say, 2019 decision on organized crime, reversed onus, and the influence of the Constitution. And how should we use Section 36? How the limitation clause becomes the ultimate issue of balancing these rights. The right to a good environment versus the right to privacy, dignity, and especially also the right to confront evidence. In other words, to cross-examine. The fourth one, we must maintain data and improve on it. The third one, ladies and gentlemen, to propagate standards. I can tell you as we move on, if we're going to have a conference in two years' time, I can tell you there will be a change or an amendment of Section 212.4 of the Criminal Procedure Act. It already covers computer technology. It already covers fingerprints and footprints and bodily features. But it can also be linked to the way in which you produce it. Not in the old-fashioned way, but by using computer and new technology. And then, of course, to balance the concerns in Section 36. I'm not going to say a lot about this. The devices, ladies and gentlemen, are in a development stage. 
They're improving on a daily basis. The one that I'm going to refer you to, just to jump because of the sake of time, what a beautiful acronym, Labrador. It's a lightweight analyzer for buried remains and decomposition over recognition. Labrador. And I'll give you a picture of Labrador. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an improvement of what dogs can do. But you can also say, we had a test on the dogs, we used this computer or that robot called Labrador, and it came up with the same results. Beautiful corroboration to my more evidence policies. In conjunction with this, that is the main thing. This is how it looks, very simple, very straightforward. And the results, amazing. You all know about cameras. In the old fashioned way, very expensive, not very reliable. You put on a camera, it is a movement detection, is the focus. And you get all these false alarms. Nowadays, they can program it to such a way that they will not, the innocent giraffe walking through the path will not be triggering the alarm or put up at the screen. There's something wrong. Now they can even go further. There's a difference in the way that the rhinos react towards a lion being present and the poacher. It's in the development stage. And unbelievable. If you have that chip, ladies and gentlemen, and you can immediately be notified where it is, what it happened, then of course you can react. More than that, this little camera the size of your middle finger, your big pinky, one and a half to two years battery life. Not expensive at all. You know where they are. Only you know where they are. That we are. And then we've got the important computer programs. Result, ladies and gentlemen, that device of trail guard, I think, is the way forward. It's not too expensive at the moment in Tanzania. Huge, huge successes since 2018. And then, of course, the new device, and with that equipment, it's uh, been powered by Google's automatic clips camera and in partnership. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for people with a lot of money contributing. So I mean that not the only actor, Leonardo, that is contributing. <coughs> we should get our money from people with money. And that should solve our problem with budget constraints. And tell them, these are the successes. Do you want to contribute? And that is my message. Look at this. In one year, they decided we're going to close shop. And I did, I'm not mentioning the, the private reserve. It's very close to where we are. At that stage, they lost 70 of their rhinos. That's a lot. They started with this. And this was an American coming to visit them. And he said, what do you need? I will subsidize this. And they move on. And ladies and gentlemen, within two years, not a single rhino lost. Success. That is 2016, cut by 96% from 2017 to August 2019. By August 2019, their record was lost because there was one rhino killed a week after my statistics. So, but that is fine. Connection conservation expanded into our neighboring countries, Mozambique, Zambia, and Kenya, and therefore, I think we should also become part of the party. There's another one. The Sig Fox Foundation, arm of the French technical firm, they say, ladies and gentlemen, we want to transmit the data, I already mentioned that, they talk about the Google map of rhinos. I have my personal concern that this can land in the wrong hands, and it will cause more damage than good, we must be aware of that. There's my course, another wonderful acronym, Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security. This is automated. This is algorithms. This is machine learning. This is a specific algorithm that will assist us. In that specific case, ladies and gentlemen, in Uganda in 2014, it was rolled out. It's making huge progress in Malaysia. And, and we integrate it with Air Shepherd. This is the droning to tell us in night with, with um, ultra red images that what we can do in, to be proactive, not only wait until the rhinos were killed. 
Okay, I've got three minutes left. This is the result. If you're interested, you're welcome. I can forward this to you. You have the statistics. Amazing. Let me just get to the law quickly. I'll have it. All of it. I mentioned some of it. We do not have a jury, so you can't have that emotional reaction from a jury, not anymore. Yes, I changed in 1988. You now have the discretion. In the interest of justice, you can allow you say. They should use it because that was after Chupido and Shabalala. Third one, the reverse owner's case. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to refer to this case. There's, there's this section of 212.4, but look at this. Okay, constitutional, there's the right to privacy, environment, Confrontational clause that I mentioned, the limitation clause. So, boy, constitutional court case. In the Prevention of Organized Crime Act, let me just re refresh your memory. Rhino poaching in many cases, organized crime, looking for the syndicate leader, not the person on the ground. And that the Savoy case said something very important. There's a reason for the exception that yes, they should be admissible. And that is section two. We need in organized crime to act more. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to say after 2014, we have a recent case following that Wilkinson's case. The Wilkinson's case, and I'm just going to say the sad thing, it fell off, so it is an obiter judgment. I hope very soon we will have a ratio digitally judgment that will have a very, very, or a bit of forceful uh, uh, following influence. Congratulations, Mulethi Judge. Look at the last part. The frequency of rhino poaching, the difficulty of prosecution, and it's easy for applicants just to disprove some of it. And there, ladies and gentlemen, they said the reverse owner's provision should be constitutional instead of some of the other cases. The way forward, I don't know, last second, last bullet, what the future real ones or artificial intelligence is still to be determined and that will be my last may us ladies and gentlemen in future still have those during winter time also my own picture and also during summer time may we have that to show to our children and grandchildren it feels good to be in the best place on earth and if we can link dogs with technology you will have that satisfaction on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Very much.